Advent, a season of watching and waiting, a season of keeping our eyes peeled for signs of hope. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Hi, my name is Ed Horstman and welcome to the online service from Round Hill Community Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. We are delighted that you have joined us for this online service of worship and we look forward to staying connected with you in this way. And welcome to the season of Advent. I'm wearing this blue stole because blue is the color often associated with the season of Advent and it is the color of hope. So during these days of watching and waiting leading up to our celebration of Christmas, we watch and wait with hope for signs of God's grace and activity in the life of the world. As always, please visit our website, roundhillcommunitychurch.org, for the latest information about programs related to worship and learning and service. May the blessing of God be with each and every one of you, and together with people of faith, hope, and love all across the world, let us worship God. Let us pray. God, our Deliverer, whose approaching birth still shakes the foundation of our world, may we so wait for your coming with eagerness and hope that we embrace without terror the labor pangs of the new age. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Please join with me as we offer responsively a lighting for the first Advent candle. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promises I have made. To you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. In you, O God, we trust. The one who is coming will show us the path of steadfast love and faithfulness. Teach us your ways, O God of our salvation. We light this candle in the sure hope that God's promises endure. Advent is a season that's associated with hope. But the scripture lesson that is read traditionally on the first Sunday of the season of Advent does not sound very hopeful. It sounds more like the ending of a world than the beginning of one. It's believed that this particular passage, written in the gospel according to Mark, reflects a time in the life of Jesus' contemporaries when the world felt like it was ending. And yet, it wasn't so much the ending of the world as the ending of a world, a certain experience of being. And out of this particular tumultuous experience for the disciples of Jesus and others of his followers did in fact come a new life and Christianity was born and people who were affiliated with the Jesus movement moved out into the Mediterranean world and beyond. So a reading from the Gospel according to Mark Chapter 13, verses 24 through 27, and 32 through 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. But about that day or hour, no one knows, 
neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Good morning, Ed. Hi, Leslie. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Round Hill Radio. Uh, this is not your normal message, you're probably noticing, because I'm here too, which is fun. But this is, we are in our Round Hill Radio studios right mm -hmm. now, where we record every week for Round Hill Radio, which you can get wherever you get your favorite podcasts, and on YouTube, our Round Hill Community Church YouTube uh, channel. So this morning, we're doing a fun thing, which uh -huh. is what we're calling Ask Ed. Yes. Or what I consider <laughs> most of my day. And it's a bit of fun experience asking people for their questions that they mm -hmm. might have for you. So I'm sort of, I'm here to facilitate those questions. Right. G give us our podcast feel. And there's no softballs today. No, there are not. We have some, We asked for questions and they gave us questions. They gave us questions and I'm so glad for it. <laughs> I'm so here for it. So <laughs> the first question is kind of, two people asked similar versions of the same question, I think, mm -hmm. or sort of the same topic. So I'm going to give you those um, sort of as one question. Mm -hmm. So here's the first one. It says, uh, this question is related to faith, says our, our question asker. When a tragedy occurs, a child dies of some dreaded disease or a young spouse is killed in an accident, the question is, how could God let this happen? It is just not fair. How do you respond to such a comment? Mm -hmm. So then another person also asked, that saying, when bad things happen to good people, seems like the model for what happened to Jesus. If someone has seen a tremendous amount of suffering due to working in a hospital, how would you tackle the question, how can there be a God? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same, I would say, umbrella mm -hmm. for this question of like, if God's looking out for us, right? What, what's going on? Yep. What's going on here? Yeah, if God is if God is love, right? If God is in control, if God is in power, mm -hmm. then how can all of those things happen? Right. They're happening all the time. And uh, you're absolutely right. These are two questions that were really challenging. So when I read through the list of questions that had been asked, I saw these first and thought, wow, you know, we are we are asking this is in some ways the the toughest question of all. These are huge it's a right? it's a huge question. And it's appropriate to uh, raise these questions, especially at the beginning of the season of Advent, because Advent is not only the first season in a new Christian year, mm -hmm. but it's actually, uh, it's an interesting time because although it's associated with hope, the first reading in the first Sunday for the season of Advent is almost always about a dark time coming for the people of earth and for humankind. And that always struck me as so odd, right? So these questions come in a sense, um, they're almost in alignment with the scripture lesson for this morning's service mm -hmm. from the gospel according to Mark, talking about a very dark time for the people of faith. So this is a huge question. And the first thing that came to mind um, as I considered how to answer it is that over the years, when I have been brought into the lives of people who have suffered a staggering loss, um, there's no explanation that's going to work at that time. Mm -hmm. No matter what I could say in response to the raw feeling and sense of devastation that people feel, it's those words would dissolve as soon as they would emerge from my mouth, right? So when people experience the kind of tragedies that our two uh, questioners are, are speaking about, in the actual situation where that's happening, there aren't, it's not time for explanations. You know, it's time for presence, for support, for love. How can a pastor be part of the process that helps a family to navigate that challenging time? Those times are being navigated 
all the time in all places, right? So um, when I read these questions, uh, so however, we have a little bit more time here in our, you know, in this context of this message to be able to think about this. And I just want to offer a very few thoughts because it is such a gigantic issue and right. theme. Right. Um, so here's an interesting thing that didn't occur to me until last night when I was thinking about this. And that is that in the entire time that I went to seminary, so three years, and I also went on and got a doctor of ministry, mm -hmm. I only had two people, two teachers ever even talk about what to say in a situation like this. Really? Which is stunning to me. Right. So I guess that says a little something about my theological education. <laughs> so what I had to discover in relationship to these questions really is something I had to discover in the crucible where people experience those losses. Mm -hmm. So I had to really learn my way through that. I will say the two comments that I did receive were really helpful to me at the time. One was made by Bill Holiday, who used to teach at Andover Newton Theological School. He was a pastor when he left seminary before he went on to become a teacher. And, uh, there was a young person that died in his parish. He went to visit the family, and the person's younger brother was there and immediately came out to Bill and said, how could God let this happen? You know, how could God take my brother? That was the language that was used, and that's language that I've heard frequently over the years. How could God take this person? Mm -hmm. And Bill said, God didn't take your brother, but God received him. Wow. So to be able to say something that brief that just shifts the consciousness a little bit. Um, it also underscores God as a loving presence, a receiving presence, not someone at fault right. or to blame, but does it in a way that respects the person's feeling at the time. Of course. Right. The other, the other um, comment that I heard was from William Sloan Coffin, Riverside Church. Uh, his son died in an automobile accident when I was a student at Union Theological Seminary, and many of us worshiped at Riverside Church Sunday to Sunday. And um, he said that after the memorial service for his son, he was sitting in a living room with a crowd of people, and they were trying to console him, and someone came into the room, and he said she was well-meaning, but she said, how could God let this happen? And uh, Bill was angered at the comment, and he stood up and he said, uh, listen, God's heart was the first one to be broken, hmm. which is a comment I've heard more and more over the years. That's become more of a common response in tragedies. It's one that not only pastors offer, but people you know, will offer to their friends when they have a loss. And uh, again, it's, it's a way to shift the, the perception that God isn't causing it, isn't even letting it happen, it's part of a world in which free creative forces have been allowed to be at play. Right. And in a world like that, tragedies happen. Beautiful things happen. Wonderful things happen. But there's also room for natural disaster and horrifying things that happen between people because that freedom has been allowed. It's woven into the creation. These are not things that you can say in depth, right? In the moment. Right. That, that's where that one single line to say that God's heart is broken here too. And I sincerely believe that. I mean, I think the stories of the Bible show that over and over again. God's so often brokenhearted, you know, had a sense of loss because it's, it's a God who has set this creative movement in play, but then also has relinquished some control over it. That idea of control is, is I feel like the the, the sort of center of that question, because mm -hmm. I feel like the hope is that maybe God is in control of all these things. Yes. And the idea that God is not is some f free will, but also can, you know, you, you want to feel like there is a benevolent force in control all the time. Right. And you walk out your door and learn that quickly that that is not true. That's right. You know, when I lived in New York City, there was a, you know, in the apartment buildings, not just there, but everywhere, it's it's not, didn't used to be unusual for a superintendent to be in the building mm -hmm. and uh, or a supervisor of some sort. And I used to think that f for a lot of people, that's kind of how God, that's their perception of God. God's like the superintendent who lives up on the, you know, 23rd floor. <laughs> and actually life goes on pretty well for the most time. We let, we let 
the super do whatever that person needs to do. And, yeah. but when the shower breaks or the stove needs fixing or whatever, then we want that person to be attentive. Right. And that's a little, that, that's sort of the way I think some people operate in relationship to God. Like sure. when things really go askew, we call out for help. Um, most times we say, you know what? I got this. Right. Right. I got, I got life under control. And, um, but when that doesn't happen, then we want somebody who's in control. And that's not really the vision of the biblical God. This idea of a God who is in control all the time, who, um, you know, is omniscient, omnipotent, um, all of that, that's grown, that image has grown up beyond what I think the Bible has to offer, where God is actually incredibly vulnerable. That's the thing we don't like. Hmm. when we really begin to understand that, because that means, wow, we are all collaborators, but we are also vulnerable to the forces around us. There aren't perfect safeguards. And um, so I think another thing I once heard Bill Coffin say, and he might have even said this in the same sermon when he was talking about his son, which, by the way, was one of the most poignant sermons I ever heard in my life. But he said... Um, the biblical world is one of minimum protection, maximum support. So protections are thin, mm -hmm. but support is always there. And I think that that's why the church plays such an incredible role in the lives of people, all communities of faith, that when there are tragedies and transitions, we actually embody the presence of God in those places. My guess is that if you ask most people at the time of a tragedy, you know, they, they probably would feel like, you know what, I'd be willing to trade off some of that free will if I could have my loved one back. Right. Right. And we would say that instantly. But that's not the way the world has been created and structured. And it's much more complicated than that and uncertain than that. And I, I think um, when I think about the, the sense of what we're thinking when there has been a loss, I think about Christmas how does God come into the world? Yeah. A baby. About as vulnerable as you can get. Right. And in the context of the Roman Empire, an absolute zero, mm -hmm. right? Of no consequence to an empire. What happens to Jesus when he is, uh, you know, just beginning his ministry is unfolding over three years? He's crucified. He's vulnerable. He's fragile. And I think that once we understand that this is how God has chosen to be in the world and to choose love, rather than power, um, then we begin to understand that God is with us and for us every single step of the way and will continue to love us back into wholeness when we're broken and hurting and that we will stand by one another in the name of that God. That's what we say when a person's hurting. We dare not say more than that. Over time, there can be other conversations, but when People are really, really raw from loss to say, God is with us and for us, and I'm going to be with you and for you as you grow, as we grow together through this. Um, I think those are the only words we can really say at that time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, that's a topic for a whole, a whole episode of the podcast or a whole series of them mm. even. Mm -hmm. um, it's such an, uh, a wonderful perspective. Thank you for that. Um, I would also like to encourage you, our wonderful member of our community, if you want to be part of this conversation about this topic or any of the next questions we have coming up, please feel free uh, to visit roundhillradio.org. We have a comment box right at the top, so we'd love for you to join the conversation with us, submit any questions or any feedback you have on, on this conversation. Our next question Mm -hmm. says, uh, the book, A Marginal Jew Rethinking the Historical Jesus by John, is it Mayer? Meyer. Meyer. Makes me wonder, how long did it take biblical scholars to agree to the current version of time and place in the Bible? And how long ago was that? Hmm. It's a great question. I love it. Yeah. You know, one thing about Round Hill Community Church, if people can surface like the most difficult questions to ask, <laughs> they will do it. So... We said no softballs. Thank you to, I mean, it's wonderful that people are just thinking about, right? Yeah. These, these kinds of issues and questions, which are so important to faith. Mm -hmm. So I guess my quick answer to this, um, you know, how long did it take biblical scholars to agree to the current version of time and place in the Bible? 
they're still doing it. <laughs> they are still figuring it out. Um, I read a wonderful book a few weeks ago. I actually reread it called Who Wrote the Bible, mm -hmm. which was just, it was a detective story trying to piece together the authorship of the first five books of the Bible in particular. And at the end of that, uh, which was amazingly, to me, it was a very persuasive argument from this author about a certain way of dating these books. I then talked with a friend of mine who is uh, a student at Union Theological Seminary. And I said, well, you know, what do you think about that book? He said, well, it's one voice among many and uh, it can go in a lot of different directions. And I thought, okay, there's clearly no consensus about any of this. Aww. And uh, there's just, there's clearly a lot of debate and people love to debate these things. So I was talking also with a friend of mine who's a scholar, Hal Tausick, who used to teach at Union, and we were talking about the dates for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the four portraits we basically have of Jesus. And I said, you know, what do you think about the dates for those? And he said, yeah, you know, they're still kind of up in the air. <laughs> okay. If, like up in the air in terms of like exactly <laughs> what date or like what decade um, or what century you like know, where are we talking <laughs> definitely century right wow, yeah. yeah so he'll say well you know there's some people who think that the gospel of luke was written about 70 years after jesus some people think 120 years after jesus i mean that's a pretty big gap that's a some might say a lifetime that is a lifetime yeah. right especially if you were living 2000 years ago yeah, maybe, especially if, maybe yeah. several lifetimes yeah so what, what I think is, is really interesting about this, and this is not, I don't think we often find ways in our local churches to think about this, but in theological schools, in seminaries, mm -hmm. and you were part of that culture as well, yep. all around the world, people are constantly doing research to ask these questions. And it was not all that long ago when the idea was that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. That was the understanding, what is now known as the Torah, you know, the central uh, kind of teaching in Judaism. Well, that, that idea began to slip away in the late 1800s, and it continued to slip away. So now, over time, scholars went back to those books and tried to understand, so how many authors were there involved in this process? and over what period of time, and actually discovered that a lot of those texts were written during the exile when the people of Israel right, had been basically deported off of their land by the Babylonians, taken to live in Babylon. But a lot of the sacred texts that we now read, including good sections of the book of Genesis, were written during the exile. That was 500 years before Jesus. Right. And so... Just understanding that completely changes the way we read those texts. Right. So uh, I think what I understand from this particular question is that, you know, when, when were the texts themselves written and the events within those texts, I would say it's under constant debate. And the debate is important because it does shed light on how we will read those documents. And um, I think that's a very exciting, but also perplexing process, you know, for, for us to kind of understand. And we still can be grateful for the scholars who dig into that because they're always surfacing new information that can shed light on the way that we have read some of our most treasured and familiar stories. And I guess the, I guess the last comment I would leave, you know, the Bible is, it's layered, it's heavily layered, and you get these surface layers that are more recent all the way down to deep, deep texts that started out as oral tradition probably eight or 900 years before Jesus was born. And he was the inheritor of those stories and then passed them on. And likewise with us, we're inheriting them and passing them on. So we have a great Bible study at Round Hill <laughs> Community Church. That's where we often get into these questions, mm -hmm. and we will continue to do so. So I'm sorry this is kind of a vague answer, but it is always in process, and we are always yeah. trying to understand um, that, it, that this is not a fixed text. Right. Right. That it has, that it, there's still a lot of digging and exploration to do to figure out just who wrote the texts and when yeah. and why? I have to uh, tease you a little bit because when I was going to promo people getting questions for this uh, message, 
I wanted to write, got questions, Ed's got answers. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, well, <laughs> or, or like, got questions, we've got answers. Well, you've got questions, we have also questions. <laughs> now we're getting close. To, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the best thing to be is a questionologist. There you go. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's being on the safe side of things. Okay. This is the closest we have to a, a softball question, which is, <laughs> What is the history of the Advent wreath? <laughs> this is a great question. What is the history of the Advent wreath, Ed? Well, I want to share this great name with uh, with our with our listeners, Johann Heinrich Wichern. Yeah. Right, a German pastor who yeah. lived between 1808 and 1881, is given some credit for the creation of the Advent wreath, and apparently, he used it as a teaching advice for children in a mission school in Germany. So his idea was he took an old cartwheel. And placed it on its side, I guess. And then he adorned that cartwheel with a lot of candles. Mm -hmm. And I think he used it as a teaching device so that, you know, perhaps he had candles, a candle for every single day leading up to the birth of Jesus. Like an advent calendar. Like an advent calendar. I love advent right? Calendar so Doubling much. as a candle, right? candelabra. Candle, yeah. So I did a little bit of digging about this. And there's a fascinating book called To Dance with God by Gertrude Mueller Nelson. Beautiful book. And, it's, and it sort of digs back into the history of a lot of these things. Um, her, her approach to this is that actually this understanding of taking the cartwheel was indeed the way that the Advent wreath got started. But she thinks that it predates the pastor, Pastor Wichern. She thinks that probably in some of these villages in Germany, when winter hit, um, they may have disabled some of their carts and done some work on them, which meant that the pace of time moved differently. Mm. So it's like kind of taking off you know, the front left wheel of your car and saying, <laughs> you know what, we're just putting that up on blocks for winter tires. Winter tires, you know, <laughs> can't drive that car. It's only got three now. So uh, it's it was designed because they changed the the literally the implements they were working with. It changed their experience of time, mm -hmm. and we do think about Advent as a season that focuses on waiting, and the waiting that often accompanies any great change. You know, we say we're waiting for we're waiting to hear about a job, we're waiting to hear some good news. You know, we're waiting to hear about a relative's new life developing overseas or whatever it is. So that waiting can be a hard experience for us because time slows down. Yeah. It's out of our control. Mm -hmm. It's going back to the first question, mm -hmm. kind of out of our power. On the other hand, God's doing something in that waiting, you know, at deep subterranean levels. So I think the Advent wreath becomes a way of marking time a little differently, mm -hmm. slowing things down. Um, eventually, it apparently the Advent wreath went through quite a set of transformations and went from cartwheel to smaller wheel, eventually to evergreens, which is another way of expressing the message that God's love endures forever. It's always fresh. Faith is fresh. And then each candle came to symbolize one week with a central candle as the Christ candle symbolizing the birth of Christ. The colors have changed over the years. Some traditions use only four red candles and then the center candle is usually white. Uh, in our tradition, it's usually three blue candles for Advent to symbolize hope. The fourth candle is either pink or rose color to symbolize the joy of Mary as she discovers that she's pregnant with Jesus. Uh, in the Orthodox tradition, you have six candles because it takes a little longer to get to Christmas <laughs> than it does in the Protestant world, um, Roman Catholic world. And so there are some more candles there. But so again, you know, it's interesting. It's a fluid tradition mm. and the colors don't always match up. The number of Sundays don't always match up. But I would say in the end, it's the Christ candle in the center that matters the most. That's where we're headed. That's what we're waiting for as we're waiting for some new birth to take place in our lives right now where we feel like that freshness is needed. Our next two questions are from some of our young friends. Yes. And they do not mince words. No, they don't. First one, does God know the future? Does God know the future? I love this question. And I would also add, just putting myself in the mind of our young people, does God know the future? And do you know if God knows the future? Because <laughs> right. you never know. Right? Yeah. So here's my thought about this. I think God is an artist. 
Say more. I think God is a creative force. And the way that is talked about in the Bible is that God is often described as spirit, powerful spirit. And that spirit creates things. It creates world. It uh, creates good things to happen for people. It breathes new life into people when we're feeling tired or discouraged. And so as an artist, I would say that God has a vision for the future and discovers with us what that future will look like. So does God absolutely know the future? I would say that it's more like God really feels that God has an idea about what the best possible future will look like, and then is doing everything in God's power to draw us towards living towards that future. Is God a man or a woman? Going from one easy question to the <laughs> next. Um, so I, I love this question as well. I love it, yeah. So um, I actually used that word spirit deliberately. I saw that. Because if God is an artist and God is spirit, well, that word spirit is usually associated with the feminine mm -hmm. in Hebrew. And I think if we take a look at all these wonderful stories in the Bible, what it actually describes quite often is that God is sometimes male sometimes female, sometimes described as a male soldier, sometimes described uh, as a, um, a mother, sometimes described as an eagle who looks after her young, sometimes described as a chicken who looks after her young. <laughs> so it doesn't say that God is either man or woman, but that God has these different parts of God's self that are sometimes male, sometimes female. That's mm -hmm. how the Bible describes it. But the spirit is really this beautiful way that God has of acting in the world. And we feel that spirit when we have energy and when we're excited, when we're happy, when we're full of joy. That's, I think, when we're really close to God. So um, this is a really tough question. <laughs> I'm going to keep thinking about it. And um, that's my answer for now. I think that was a great answer. If I can chime in, I also feel like Please. assigning gender, <laughs> assigning gender to God feels like we are limiting God by our human uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. And as we are living in a world where gender is becoming less and less of a box, um, I think mm -hmm. we're able to more picture a God that is all expressions of of masculine and feminine and is the the best of all the things. Mm, I love that. That's how I picture it. I that. love your phrase, all expressions. Yeah. Right? All these things that are possible in human lives, both, you know, in, in all from all people, God expresses the best of that. I think I got that from you, from you were telling me, explaining to me about the Trinity, that the Trinity are different oh. expressions of God. I do listen. <laughs> I do. We help I, each other out. I learn right along with everyone else. <laughs> Last one. Love it. Because we have just uh, celebrated Thanksgiving. Yes. And we did actually just do a podcast episode a few weeks ago about gratitude. Mm -hmm. This is more about gratitude because uh, our questioner says that their favorite holiday is Thanksgiving because it is mm -hmm. all about gratitude. What... Do you like to do to be in gratitude? Which I love how that phrase mm. is phrased. What's you to be in gratitude? I just love I just love tips for staying in gratitude. They say let's have some tips. Okay, here's some tips. Some tips. Let's get some right to it. Gratitude tips to be in gratitude. So I, I I also love that phrase to be in gratitude. Mm -hmm. It's like a permanent state of being, yeah. right? Not just an occasional action. Yes. So that's a beautiful thought. Really appreciate that from the questioner. Uh, some tips. So these are things I've collected over the years and try to, to bring out from time to time. Yep. One way of being in gratitude is to take a little meditative walk around your living space hmm. and uh, to, tour, to tour the living space. And you might find one thing in particular for which you're grateful, maybe because it connects with a memory of a loved one who's no longer with us uh, or an event in your life. And to be grateful for that. But it's like taking a tour of our of our own dwellings, which I think sometimes we may take for granted. 
for sure. Right. Um, I love this idea of that someone shared with me of, of writing a letter of appreciation to an author. If somebody's, uh, someone's book has really, really just touched your heart or opened up a new insight, actually taking the time and to write the, the author in care of the publishing house, who knows, and see if it gets there. I've known people who've written those letters and gotten some wonderful replies. Nice. Um, so again, an expression of gratitude. Uh, the same thing I've um, experienced with someone saying to me, you know, after you see a movie, give thanks for something about that film. So it's not like, oh, that was a great movie. That was really cool. And then on we go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But what, what did you learn or see for the first time or look at from a different angle in a movie that really might be a, a help, right? Going forward and, and to give, and to give great gratitude for that. Um, but what about sending a gift of flowers to a group of activists in your town, mm. group of people who are, really dedicated to a cause and maybe we don't have the time or the energy to actually join them in their activist work but we could say really appreciate what you're doing and thank you for doing that on behalf of all of us and not you know right out of the blue i know how much that means to people when they hear that that word of gratitude and um here's one that's really obvious it's about saying grace before a meal and uh, which isn't necessarily, I don't, you know, maybe not that common anymore, but not only to do that, but to pause before the meal and then, and to say the, say the grace, but then to pause a second time and let the grace sink in. Hmm. So, you know, quite often, sometimes we might say something before a meal. We thank you, God, for this meal and may it bless us so that we may bless others. Then we go right into amen and off we go. But what if we said amen and then just paused for a moment? Let that grace sink in. That to me would be an example of being in gratitude for a little bit longer than just saying and moving on. That's so wonderful. And thank you so much, everyone that mm -hmm. submitted questions. Yes, for today. And we encourage you to visit roundhillradio.org to submit some more if this brought up uh, different ideas for you and different comments. We would love to hear them. So thanks for listening. Roundhill Radio is brought to you by the friends and members of Roundhill Community Church. For more information, please visit roundhillradio.org.
to our service of Holy Communion. If you have not prepared some elements for you to partake, you can just pause the video and then come back when ready. All are welcome at the table of the Lord, which has long been set. Come and partake. Let us pray. O God of majesty and mercy, we bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. You have set us in the world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. We remember your covenant with our ancestors in the faith, the prophets you sent to call us back to your way, and how in the fullness of time out of your great love for the world, you sent your beloved son to be one of us, to redeem us, to heal us and to form us anew to be your people and the world. Gracious God, may the bread we break and the cup we bless become for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ that we may be united with all your people in every time and place. Jesus, on the night when he was delivered over to death, took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat my bread and drink my body, you proclaim the death of the Lord till he comes again. Let us partake together. Let us pray. God of grace and compassion, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we give thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ. As you raised Jesus from death and call us from, with him from death to life, May we bear witness to your resurrection power, alive and at large in our world. Amen. Let us pray. God of mystery and miracles, your word brings light and hope into the shadowy places of our lives and in our world. Your presence gives us strength to endure when we are pushed beyond our own strength. Our world is in need of your strength and light. In the season when we wait for the birth of a baby, it may feel odd to see the strength in one who was so vulnerable. And yet you call us to stand with those who are vulnerable. Today we pray for those who are in the LGBTQ plus community as they continue to face threats and violence from those fueled by fear and hate. Surround them, assure them of your love and presence. We pray for a sense of protection for Jewish brothers and sisters who worry when they gather to worship, that others may do them harm because of their beliefs and practices. Give them hope and an assurance of your presence. For all who are afraid on college campuses due to recent killings, restore a sense of trust and hope. Draw them together as communities of people supporting one another. Help us to know how we may stand with others as people who follow your call to love neighbors as we love ourselves. You find us in the midst of our lostness and with love beyond our imagining you lead us home. And yet even in that desire to serve you, we resist you at times. We resist loosening our tight grip on our lives. We hesitate to trust you, for you may lead us where we do not want to go. 
You know the places in our hearts and in our minds where we are all well defended against your intrusions. In this season of longing, grant us grace to bring all that we are to you, O Christ. All the broken places, all the lost wanderings, all the weariness from trying to live lives that are enough. May we see you. Hold us all in the fullness of your love. Then be born in us, that we may find our home, our life, our joy in you, Holy One of light and love. Amen. And let us pray together the Round Hill Community Church prayer. Our Heavenly Father, shed forth thy blessed spirit upon all our lives. Make each one of us an instrument in thy hands for good. Purify our hearts, strengthen our minds and bodies, fill us with Christian love. Let no pride, no self-conceit, no rivalry, no ill will ever spring up among us. Make us earnest and true, wise and prudent, giving no just cause for offense. And may thy holy peace rest upon us this day and every day throughout the coming week, sweetening our trials, cheering us in our work, and keeping us faithful to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to a whole new Christian year, the beginning of the season of Advent, the beginning of our watching and waiting for signs of hope. So go forth in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen.